million questions to ask, but I'm going to restrict to one. Uh, this is a question which is very close to my heart because I'm an architect. Um, you know, from time immemorial, right down from the colonial uh, colonization of India, governments have made willful decisions to overturn history. Uh, right down from introducing English as a language of uh, uh, civil service. So post-independence, in the, in the need to industrialize, Nehru actually went out and brief, made a brief for Chandigarh, which said to design a city unfettered by the presence of the past. That was Corbusier's brief. And Corbusier was imported into this country, which, will, which has had the skill of master craftsmen and guilds and guilds and guilds of architects, which still make India the country for which the Western world visits us. However bad we do on our tourism numbers, but it is, it is our international presence, a visual of our architecture. Till date, and then, then, of the three schools of design that existed in this country, almost all graduating batches trained at Chandigarh for the next two decades. Then they go out and form the public works department of this country, and we get what we see today. And this continues without patronage, only on a path set by Nehru. This now is today, our developers, very good point. our developers go out and say, we need foreign architects. The term foreign architects is absolutely wonderful and fantastic and well, well incorporated into our system and has become one with the DNA of this country's development. And I'll tell you one thing. Hmm. A friend of mine, an Indian, who lives in Princeton, very dear friend of mine, she's an architect. Her company, which is a major American architecture company, got the architecture contract for the Sadar Patel statue hmm. by Modi. And I was very surprised. I said, why would they bring an American architecture firm? Yeah. And when we say they, foreign... They, they asked my advice how to pitch. What is, uh, how do you make it uh, Hindu friendly and all. I, I, I just sitting over in their house chatting. I, di I didn't have any formal role. But they wanted to pick a lot of people's brains to make sure their proposal is good. And it's they accepted. came back, they won the contract. Then they delivered the first phase, second phase and all that. I don't know. I'm just an observer. But it bothered me that, uh, you know, we have this complex... And when we say foreign architect, we only mean Gora architect, not no, African, no, no. Are, Japanese. Uh, today, to, no, today we are okay with Singaporean, we are okay with Vietnamese also, we are okay with South African also. Yeah, it means non-Indian. Non -Indian, but not African. No, no. African is still not I, I want to go one. Uh, okay. but, but let me tell you, ask you this. Suppose, suppose, hypothetically, if Rajiv Gandhi had married an African huh. rather than Sonia Gandhi, do you think that that African wife of his and widow would have been as powerful? No, no, of course not. Is so, there a, is there a color complex? So, so I was I, coming to that. So I was coming to that as the next thing. So as a young Indian architect who had studied in Premier Institute, also promoted by Nehru, the concept of Premier Institute, Indian Institute of Technology, School of Planning and Architecture, as a student graduating from that, I felt, I felt that there must be something, a shortcoming in me. So I decide that I will go and get what the best also, what the best has to <coughs> offer. And I go and get that. Today in this country, when I try and operate, I said, you want the Indian best? On paper, I have it. You want the Western best? On paper, I have it. Now, please tell me what is it that is bothering you? Huh? It is the color. It is clearly the color. Because brand myself has incorporated the best of India and the West. I'm very glad you raised this. Mm. Two books that educated me a lot, I'll tell you about it a little bit and then I'm writing a sequel to that. The first book was, and I'm trying to understand American history through identity formation. So one book is called How the Irish Became White. Now you all think Irish are white. But in the American system, whiteness was a labor category. You had to join white unions to be called white. So when the blacks were freed from slavery, they would undercut their labor rates and they would get jobs. So to protect white labor, they created white only unions. That's the origin of unions in America. And they would get contracts that you cannot be hiring non-union people. So this white union origins started. But then when, it, when Irish immigrated, the problem was that they were a colony of England. So back home, the guy is a colonized person under the English. 
but now he comes to America and wants to join as an equal. So they were excluded from being white in terms of unions. Also, they were Catholics, whereas the yeah. So they were, but the, but the but the yeah, but the the colonization was a factor. So they had a war. They had I mean they had this kind of a violence and all that, and then a treaty was raised that okay, Irish will be treated as white. So that's the story of how the Irish became white. Then there's another book that influenced me a lot in this: how the Jews became white folks where until early 1900s, the Jews were not considered whites. The white Jews themselves didn't think of themselves as whites. And so all this, how they mobilized, how they created the Anti-Defamation League and legal cases, whatever, whatever, and the Jews finally became white. And one of the books I'm writing on is how the Indians become white. Now, the Indians becoming white is not white skin necessarily. It's also ideological, your accent, your style, and is it... Uh, what is the latest you can talk about? Uh, you know, what is the latest style, latest lingo uh, name dropping? Uh, so it is an intellectual branding, uh, emotional, cultural whiteness. That this, Indians, this, Indians kind of, Indians. This, this kind of branding goes against the very notion of uh, branding yourself as an Indian. That is correct. So therefore, success is doomed. So we may end up being a second class, second class Western satellite country and we cannot hope to be a superpower like China because China is not interested in being somebody's satellite. Yeah. China says we are who we are and you have to accept us as we are. Hmm. China has even got another internet. They are building their own internet which will be 100 times the speed of this internet because they don't trust that this traffic is being monitored and wiretapped and all that. So China is creating everything on its own. China is not, uh, China is sending a lot of its people to go and get MBAs and uh, technology degrees and come back to China. But China is also in parallel creating itself an education hub and bringing people from Africa, Latin America, developing countries. More foreign students coming to China every year than Chinese students going out. You see, so China is doing both. They, they, they also want to replace the West as a center of learning and we don't have that. We are not creating uh, Indian, you know, universities like Nalanda, Takshashila kind of places where we could be training the rest of the world in our way of life and our civilization. We are very happy that we are being educated somewhere else. So this, what you are referring to is a product of uh, wanting by policy to westernize. 